Tonight, another body cam video is putting a spotlight on how police interact with the mentally ill. Hello. Hey, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? As Shirley walks out, police notice a screwdriver in her son Jason's hand. Drop that for me. Drop that for me, guy. Yay! Drop it. Yay! Drop it. Yay! 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 Good morning. What's up, buddy? You got Coban out? Officer Stevens, Officer Smarrow, badge 483, 845, March 7th, 1006 AM, mental health. Yeah, this is called, this is our central magistrate's office. They need help with a man who wandered in off the street and he's in one of the courtrooms, causing a disturbance. Who's afraid of anyone in a uniform. And luckily, right around the corner from there is our local mental health authority. This one's gonna get us tied up for a while. We used to have a saying in law enforcement, ask, tell, make. I'm going to ask you to do it, I'm going to tell you to do it, and I'm going to make you do it. I understand that I'm walking into the person that didn't call me there and didn't want me there oftentimes. I respect the fact that they have a mental illness and that they don't want law enforcement interacting with them. And if it takes 20, if it takes 90, if it takes 120 minutes to convince them that one, we're not going to hurt them, and two, they're going to come with us, it's just a matter of how they're going to come with us. There's a gentleman in the gray shirt. Okay. Okay. If that takes me all day long. How you doing? I'll take all day long. You okay? Oh, no, no, this is my partner, Joe. My name's Ernie. How can we help you today? What do y'all do? We're, we're, we're with the police department. I'm a, stay right there. I'm having a hard time here. Are you okay? What, what brings you in here today? And where, where have you here. been? Right here. I haven't moved from this apartment. I could have moved from the apartment. You, you don't feel safe here? Hell no, I don't feel safe Okay. Here. We're not the only shit. I'm not a bad guy. And I said, just, and, and this happened all night. They weren't coming like all at one. They were coming for a moment. Like, because it's, it's a pretty big parking lot. They're right there in uh, West Avenue. Okay. okay. See what happened. All right, no one here is going to hurt you. You're, you're kind of scaring some of these people. Oh, you know, some of these people? Are some of the people that are trying? None of these people know you, okay? And you're kind of scared of them right now. Not to me. What, what about any drug use? I have done drugs, okay? I have I know. Done. When you were using drugs, what'd you use? Uh, I, I like everything. <laughs> everything. I drink it like water. I don't care what it is. I, I, I appreciate you being honest. <laughs> I appreciate you being honest. So, okay, so here, here's the thing, Keith. You, you were honest with me, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm just, I'm worried about you, man. I'm worried about, like... This one needs to be done. Tell me. This one needs to be done. Yeah. Go ahead and sit down, bro. We kind of catch flack internally in the department of being poor tactically. You guys got poor tactics because you sit down with people. We got to sit down with people because I'm not going to stand over them and talk down at them. I'm going to sit down and get at their level because they're going to tell me a lot more than they're wanting to tell you. So I need to gather my people. I need to, to go with them a little bit. You don't need to gather your people, Keith. This this this, this isn't a yeah, western. No, this is serious. I know it's serious. So I was trying to make it out of here, but I couldn't make it out of here. Well, we can get you out of here. 
Yeah, we you are. think someone's going to come up and do something to you while we're with you? Yeah. No. That's how crazy it is. Just walk with us, Keith. We'll, we'll show you that you're going to be safe. Come on. You mind leaving your pen, bud? Yeah, leave, it, leave your pen here. Yeah. All right. Thank you, buddy. You still nervous? Yeah. Would you feel safer just to have a seat? I got tinted windows and so nobody can see you in there. There's a place right, right down the street awesome. that, that we're going to go to. And you'll stay with us until we get there, OK? OK, have a seat. But we'll get you checked out and evaluated, OK? Yeah, we'll just go mental decomp, uh, not sleeping, uh, paranoid. finishing up his AFR from that call. It's not over, you know, as far as this call is concerned. Future follow-ups definitely in the picture. Yeah. All right. You guys have any, like, priorities? I got a uh, call from a sergeant from Central last night about how long we have to wait in the hospital Yeah. Uh, with the patient. But just kind of as a reminder, let patrol know, hey, there's no written mandate. But as a courtesy, you know, stay with the patient for at least 30 minutes, and the hospital needs to make some accommodations to get them checked into a room or have somebody watch them. Okay. We're hearing more and more about officers just refusing to do what they've been trained to do. Yep. Yes. Probably because their training was X amount of years ago. Yeah, I heard that same that same issue. Okay. So I think we may need to do more training. Thank you, Joe. My name is Joe Smar. I've been with SCPD since 2005. Uh, before that, I was in the uh, Marine Corps. Hurrah. My name is Ernie Stevens. I've been on the SAPD going on my 22nd year. Part of that was Cub Scout. Hurrah. No? no? Okay. <laughs> uh, try, man. People don't call 911 to say, hey, I just want to let you know, man, the stock market's doing great. My portfolio's on point. Uh, I'm really happy with my wife and my kids are healthy. So thank you for the work you do. That doesn't happen. Right, no one calls us to give us good news. They call us because something bad is happening in their environment, under their umbrella, something bad's happening, and so they're in a crisis. On average, in a police academy in this country, they spend 60 hours or more learning how to shoot a gun. And they spend eight on mental health and communication. We, we need to shift that. Standing by. Well, let me get out there and find out what's going on. I'll keep you updated. All right, thank you. Uh huh. Bye bye. Two mental health calls. These calls are all day long. They never stop. You know, the problem is, is there's more calls than officers. You know, and, and this is a a daily thing. So as, as we see a call come up for mental health, we'll be able to take that call, which will free up patrol to continue to answer these calls for service that, even, that haven't even been dispatched yet. He is now feeling suicidal and homicidal. You feel like wanting to kill yourself? No, no, no. OK. But you said homicidal, too. Yeah. Are you having thoughts of killing him? Yeah. How would you do that? Uh, there are knives on the car, right? OK. All right, buddy, come on. So when we go in, we're going to get you in and see the counselor, OK? Uh, this is that one from the state comptroller. They did an audit, and he said that he was going to put a bullet in his head and then walk in front of a bus. He would put a bullet through the state comptroller's head? Out through his own. And then walk in front of a bus? Uh, he's got it backwards. Since Joe's the veteran, Joe will take the lead on this. Yeah. He's got a shitload of guns in there. I knew his Navy. When it's a call involving a veteran, I step back. I mean, Joe was in the Marines. He has a language I don't have. Go ahead, go. Go ahead, go inside. No, 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 oh, no. No, no, God damn it. I don't want to go. I, I know. I know it sucks, man. You're not the first guy that we've helped, but you're the one we're helping now, my friend. And when it's a call involving children, 
I'll try to take the lead on that because Joe can struggle seeing children that are hurting them. Your mom said that you haven't been on medications and you haven't been into the crisis center? She's okay. Why do I need to be in this world? I don't have nothing. To find out who's got the quickest availability for you, okay? All right, Miss Raquel, let me walk you in and introduce you to the nursing staff. It's good meeting you, Raquel. Good luck to you, okay? We also will do maintenance calls and follow-ups. Buenos días. Buenos días. Que milagro. Ya está pensando mucho en ustedes. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Esteban, ahorita lo ven. Pasen muy bien. Can we say hi to him? Yeah. Yeah, let us say hi. I want to make sure he's still doing good. Um, and, and then if he ever falls off, you know, and stops taking medicine and stops eating and stops bathing and goes back to the way it was, then you know you call us, okay? And, uh, okay. and, and, and you're never going to be in trouble, right? But you know you can trust us? Yes. So proud of you. Thank you for uh, everything. Yes, sir. You got it, man. You got it. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll be back. Okay. We'll come in and check on you every now and again, all right? Okay. Just make sure you're doing good. <laughs> we have a very small unit. We're probably doing 5 to 7% of the actual mental health call load. So it's really a, a fraction. Hi, this is Officer Stevens. Were you calling for some help? He put my mirror on the wall and started, you know, cut in my face, and he's gonna cut me with the mirror, but then he started cutting his wood. This time he said he'll start a car and he'll do it, I'm scared he will. Okay, but so so he is suicidal? He, this is written in front of me, you know, with the mirror, when he broke that mirror. I just left right now, and okay. um... Does he have weapons? Does he own a gun? He owns a gun? I don't know if he has a gun. We should be there in probably about 10 minutes. Everybody hold on tight. We'll assume he has access to a gun. The only thing that concerned me is her saying he doesn't want to go out like no coward. A little scary. Oh, boy. One side of the window, the other one take the door. You want to do rock, paper, scissors for a door? <laughs> All right, I'll take the door. You owe me lunch, though. Element of surprise is gone. And I'm um, through the window. Several dogs. At least two dogs. And I hear a bigger one, like a wolf. OK. There are several Cujos on the inside. Patrol responded? She's diverting them right now. OK. Hey, Sarge, got to brief you on a situation. Boyfriend started cutting himself on the arm. He's been hospitalized before. Uh, he's diagnosed with depression. We got patrol responding out here right now, just in case we needed to force entry on this. Uh, sh hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you okay? Hey, we're with the police, you're not in any trouble. My name is Joe. That's my partner, Ernie. You're not in any trouble. Sarge, let me call you back. You're OK. Your girlfriend called and was worried about you. She said that maybe you cut yourself. Let me see how bad it is, OK? It was just a little minor thing. Quick, uh, quick pat. OK, let little me just minor. pat you down for weapons, OK? Yeah, go ahead. No weapons on you? No, no weapons. 7821. Thank you. Do you mind sitting down and, and relax for a second? And now, you showed me that this arm, right? Yeah. Can, can you show me the other? OK, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Let me see. It's... Okay, let me see how bad that is. Oh, that's nothing. That's going to need stitches, man. That's pretty good. That's, pre that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Let, let me have a paramedic clean it up, OK? Yeah. What branch are in the military were you? I'm in the Marines. Oh, OK. Well, there you go. Raw. How many years did you do? Seven years. Let's go down the stairs so we can see hey, the paramedics. Hey, uh, take a look at your arm. We'll know something here in just a second. We're going to work on getting him benefits with the VA. He's got a class B, but we're going to do a gel diversion on it. All right. Well, I'm glad that went well. Has anyone here, while you're in a work capacity, has anyone ever told someone, I'm scared? Nobody? OK, and how many of you, when I said that, immediately judged me and thought, this dude's, what's wrong with this guy? I would never say that, right? I'm told, I'm taught to be hard. You know, I, I, I don't get scared. You know, I'm United States law enforcement, right? Or whatever you told yourself. From day one, the moment you do a traffic stop, you walk into someone's house. Everything we do is scary. But we're taught, don't show it. Don't show fear. You don't say that. Now, I had a female called 911. Set the stage up for you. Her husband's in the house sleeping. Her kids are sleeping. 
She waits till they fall asleep. She walks outside, gets on her cell phone, calls the police. She's sitting in her driveway between two vehicles, puts a gun to her head, calls 911, says, I'm thinking about killing myself. But what is it that officers heard in that call? Gun. Gun. So what does that do? Your adrenaline pump hits, right? You're like, okay, here we go. We start formulating a plan. You start coming up with like these amazing tactical scenarios. You start thinking about what roof you're going to scale, what tree you're going to climb. You start like, people just start going wild. And I pull up and there was two sergeants, about eight, nine officers, and every trunk is popped. We're loading AR-15s, shotguns, shields. One guy was pulling out the Ram and I'm like, I thought she was in her driveway. He's like, I don't care, man. I'm freaking ready. Like, they're like... <laughs> I mean, we get so caught up in the fact that there was a gun, and that's, we become so fixated on that. And we completely forget the fact that you've got one female calling the police on her one self, wanting to kill herself. She's not wanting to go out and ambush everyone. And, you know, that, that's, that's not what that was. But that's how we're treating it because we heard gun. So Sarge says, okay, what do you think? And I said, Sarge, with all due respect, um, I think that this is way too much. Like, what's the plan here? We're going to do a skirmish down the street, like a formation, an echelon. We're going to roll up on her with shields, flashlights, long guns, pointing at her, screaming at her. You guys can all picture this. What does that look like? I'm sitting here with a gun to my head. Now I've got eight of you screaming commands at me. Put the gun down. Put the gun down. Put the gun down. Drop the effing gun. Drop the gun. Put the gun down, man. Put the gun down. Put the gun down. Damn, I'm tired. Your turn. Put the gun down. Put the gun down. Drop the gun. Drop the gun. One of three things happens there. She puts the gun down and all is okay. She shoots herself in front of everyone and that sucks or she goes to put the gun down, but someone feels like it's flagged, and then we got a da 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 42 rounds on this female that wanted to ask for help. So I said, let me call her. Has anyone called her at all? No. All right, let me call her. So I call her, she answers the phone. And I said, you know, Brenda, you don't know me. My name's Joe, I'm just down the street. Um, I said, tell me what's going on. I talked to her for a few minutes, and then I said, what are you doing right now? And she said, I'm sitting here with a gun to my head. And I said, Brenda, I'm scared. And it was like a switch went off in her head, and she said, what do you mean you're scared? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not going to hurt anybody. And I said, I know that. But I've got a lot of officers right here. And they've got all kinds of like just wild equipment out that they're wanting to march down the street to your house. And I'm afraid of what's going to happen. And I'm scared for that. And, I, you know, we have families. You've got a family in there. Like, you holding a weapon scares me. And she said, what do you want me to do? I said, you ain't going to believe this. But we actually have a guy in a tree with binoculars. And he's watching you right now. Just stand up so he can see you with the weapon put it on the hood and walk to us. And I'm going to come meet you. I'm not going to tackle you. I'm just going to come up and talk to you. This is what I'm wearing. And it worked out just like that. Why? Because I stayed calm in the moment. I knew what I was dealing with. I didn't think about gun. I thought about person. Okay. I didn't think about gun. I thought about person in crisis. All right, Mike. All right. I'll see you in the morning. All right. I hope you sleep well. All right. I came along at, at a perfect storm when everything was, was evolving here at the police department. I was working night patrol uh, in uniform. That's all I knew. And one night, my partner at the time, Willie Kasberg, decided to sign me up for a class called Crisis Intervention Training. Um, you know, we had officers with 25, 30 years on say, I'd rather retire than take that hug-a-thug type training. Ah, sweet pea. But it meant that for a week, I could be at home every night and have a weekend off. All right. I had no idea what it was, but one day a lady comes in and she talked about her son who has a mental illness, who has schizophrenia. He's paranoid all the time. He punches holes in the walls. He starts fires. And she said, one day, one of you officers might have to come to my house and there's a possibility that you might have to shoot and kill my son. And when I heard her say that, that's when things really started clicking for me. Cut it and wash it. And so me and my partner at the time made it our mission to start a mental health unit. <laughs> Before 2000, our default position for mentally ill folks for law enforcement was jail, jail, jail. The jail was overcrowded. Uh, the emergency rooms were overcrowded. 
The local mental health authority was not doing a very good job and the state was looking at taking it over completely. And I said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do one thing. I want to keep people with mental illness from being criminalized for their illness. And so I connected with the local mental health authority, the police academy, the sheriff's office, the hospitals. And so we were able to say, let's start. San Antonio police today announcing a new pilot program aimed at helping people with mental illnesses get the help they need. Police have partnered with mental health leaders to treat people with mental illness as patients, not criminals. We were told we were a six month pilot project and the chief within a year, he instituted two more positions within the mental health unit and we grew to four officers. And that's when I met Joe. I was about to walk into the back of the police station and I, I hear him call out my name. I'm like, who's this new guy? He goes, hey, uh, you know, I saw y'all are gonna have openings in, in your unit. He's like, uh, you know, I really wanna uh, come over there and interview. I said, okay, well, you know, brush up on the material that we gave you and, and, and good luck with that. I'm being honest, man. And then I hear, hey, did you hear about that tomorrow? And I was like, no, what happened? They go, they asked him, Okay, Officer Smarrow, if you could say that you had a weakness, what would that be? And his response was, well, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. You gotta be kidding me. So I thought, okay, here comes this arrogant kid, 10 years younger, you know, here we go. We end up becoming partners about a year later. And I'll tell you what, I hit the jackpot, I hit the lottery when he became my partner. I work overtime on um, weekends on patrol filling in. On average, I would say I do this about three and a half weekends a month, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me, really, because it really does mess with my sleep. And I know early on in our career, they said, don't put yourself in a situation where you depend on working overtime. But because I have five kids from different uh, you know, relationships, if I don't work any overtime at all, by the time my child support comes out and bills are paid, there is very little to nothing left. And so I do this be a good box. so that we can pay bills and take the kids out and do stuff. Four minutes. I gotta do it quick, like I'm back in the core. Oh, it's a sparrow. Everything good? I'm living the dream, sorry. I'm living the dream. What vehicle you in? Seven. Niner, Niner Zero. All right. Got you in. You need anything? Give us a haul. Thank you, sir. All right. Be careful out there. In our full-time job on mental health, you know, we, we are in plain clothes and unmarked cars, and, you know, we're out there just responding to mental health-related calls. This allows us to stay current and up-to-date as well with everything going on in patrol and responding to actual you know, 911 disturbances and all the various types of calls. There's Ernie calling me. What's up, mate? Uh, uh, hopefully you got a little sleep tonight. I did. I got about two hours. All right, well, hit me up on the computer when you get there. Okay, bye. Ernie and I will usually work overtime shifts uh, together, and it's amazing that we can still tolerate each other because Monday through Friday, we're partnered up inside the same vehicle all day and then on Friday and Saturday we don't get enough so we end up signing up for doing overtime together but I will say that patrol definitely uh, gets excited when they see us show up 
uh, a lot of the patrol guys are like, oh, good, you know, any mental health call that comes out, we're just going to give it to you guys. In fact, recently, they've sent us to two pretty high-risk situations where it was jumpers involved. Uh, one of them, the individual is up on the bridge uh, over the ledge of I-10. He goes, well, it's now or never. And he just pushed himself off. You see it, and you can't unsee it. You hear it, you can't unhear it. And when that individual let go, there was no scream, there was no yell. I can't imagine what went through his head um, as he let go. Um, because we've talked to some jumpers who have survived and they've all said, you know, that they were absolutely certain about what they wanted to do, but the moment that they let go, they wish they hadn't. And those are the ones that survive. And so, you, you know, we'll never know what his thoughts were, but I just, I would imagine that in that situation, you would yell or you would scream or you would say something, but it was just, it's now or never, disappeared, silence, one, two, Pow. And it was just a loud, like, smack. Like, it sounded like a gunshot. And I just, I paused. I, like, scurried up to the edge and just could not believe uh, what just happened. And then I remember just kind of pacing. Uh, I just was walking around, pacing, and just, like, what just happened? I mean, just kind of taken aback, you know, by, um, you know, the, just a couple hours of dialogue with this individual and then it was just, just like that it was over The mental health unit has become a passion of mine because I've been on the other side of it. I've been the one with my hand out saying, please, you know, somebody help me. I was diagnosed with PTSD. Operation Iraqi Freedom began in March of 03, two, three days into the war. We were in Amtrak vehicles, which are armored and very safe vehicles just pushing up into Iraq and we saw a firefight happening. That was my first experience at a real firefight. That was my first experience at what the sound of a bullet going by your head is, the whistle it makes. It was something that I was not prepared for. And I remember that next morning, we're still in our convoy and the top opened up like a convertible and we're standing there just looking out and I would see these vehicles on the road that were just blown up and families in them, children in them, just, I mean, people burnt to the windows. And I remember there was a boy, I, can, I could paint him, draw him today, how vividly he's in my head. And he was, in the, he was on the street, but he was maybe four and face down. And I remember looking down and he, right when we were passing, he looks up at me and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And he looked up and we just looked right into each other's eyes, but half of his head was gone. And I remember like begging for a corpsman, you know, let's, we could save this boy, you know, it's corpsman, 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 like, hey, he's alive. And not realizing the trauma he had suffered, right? Probably very minimal chance of surviving that. But just the fact that he looked up, looked at me and me begging for a corpsman to at least try. And it was, it fell on deaf ears. It was this. Who cares? He's going to grow up and be one of them. He, I, I, I ain't worried about that. And I didn't realize the toll that that would take on me. I was 18 years old and I remember like just shutting down. Good morning. Hey man, click it or ticket, right here. We've been purple in two years. Yeah. 
sometimes we meet at church, which is, um, it's a little more convenient for you, if we're honest. It, it's, well, better, you know. it's better for you. So, um, but it's, it just makes sense because we get to, you know, just catch up going in, decompress going home, and um, all while saving some gas and mileage on our cars too, so it works out. Hey, have you tried Mod Pizza yet? I haven't been yet. Because I know you're a Paisan, man. You can't stop. I can't help it. You're addicted. I almost did it last night, but I didn't do it, man. I had a salad. I was so proud of myself. Wow. <laughs> Oh, your ancestors are rolling around in their grave right They're now. They're very disappointed in me. Joey, <laughs> don't say no to the pie. <laughs> yeah, guys, we're gonna we're gonna break you up into groups. We're gonna do three role plays. We understand that we're not masters levels clinicians. And we never like to Monday morning quarterback other officers and what they do. But we know that not everybody is a born communicator. In fact, we know some of you are very poor communicators. But we also know that that's oftentimes by choice. What kind of scenario are you looking at doing today? Do you want me to be depressed, fireman? Fixation on paranoia, if you could, in your scenario is going to be? I'm thinking manic, but more on the side of, uh, of like, a, with a psychosis. Delusional. OK. Antisocial, tied in with PTSD, and everybody just Check out. Hey, if y'all could be in your rooms in five minutes, five minutes. You got a wife calling on her husband, concerned, and she said, he's getting real agitated. He punched some holes in the wall. I don't know what his deal is. So knock when you're ready and he'll come get you. So we did get a call from your wife and she sounded a little worried about you. I, I don't know what's going on. I can't sleep. She wants me to stay in the bed with her at night. It I is a tactic. It. it used to be called verbal judo. Now we're falling on the term active listening. Don't, don't, don't tell me not to tell her. Sir. Be quiet. Anytime someone's hallucinating, anytime someone is delusional, we need to try and figure out, is it medical, is it mental illness? And then assure their safety, because oftentimes when they're hallucinating, it's coupled with paranoia. They're a little concerned about that you haven't shown up to work, you haven't talked to anybody. Talk to me. This scenario right here is he's becoming disconnected. As human beings, we have to be connected, right? If I unplug a lamp, it don't work. If you unplug a human, he don't work. We like to take you with us. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. Remember now, don't assume just because they tell you I ain't going with you that we have to go hands on because the moment we go hands on, we're committed. As soon as I fall asleep, they come. I'm just not going to leave you in the water because I'm kind of lazy if that's all right. Do you mind? I don't mind. All right. Do whatever you want. So who's they? My buds. Okay. I grabbed the trigger. And all 11 of them <laughs> were turning a hammer. Good. Right when you walk in, right, shake hands, calms them down. Uh, you ask if he wants to see, he says no. So then you go and throw yourself against a wall, which again is a non threatening pose, body language, calms him down. Um, he gets amped up, he throws his hat. You didn't move at all. I didn't ask about weapons and stuff. I should have done that. That's the significance of cover, right? By building rapport with someone, by talking to them the right way, if I spend a little more time with this person, if I get them to open up to me and I can get them to willingly go with me to a hospital, to a clinic, and I can make them see that people are concerned about them, then they're more apt to get help when they get there. It was a good group. It is, sir. Wheels up. I worked right over here to the right at our local skating rink where I got to play the records. And back then, yes, we had records. <laughs> it was vinyl. You put a needle on it, it would make noise. No. I got nothing. Oh, look at this. Oh, man, you got to be kidding me. Careful, just get around it. You have to stop? Yeah. Full service.
What's up? What's up? Some man? luck, man. What's Did you just on? rub my bald head for luck? Yeah, exactly. That is not how that works. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Right. What Jonah is asked by God to do <coughs> is to humble himself for all of the world to see and not just the people that he's writing to. Hey, Joe, what's up? Trouble has arrived. I'm not your average guy that's had the average life that can just deal with a one little bump in the road. I mean, I've I've dealt with bumps throughout my whole life and I just know what I can handle and what I can't handle. And uh, I'm in a, I guess you could call it a transition phase right now. Um, I'm actually going through a divorce right now. Um, it's, it's still pending, I filed. I don't know, over a month ago. I did a lot of praying about it, and again, I, I knew that it wasn't gonna be a supported decision, but I missed the hell out of my kids. I went from seeing them every day, and waking them up and having dinner with them, to now not. Probably one of the most difficult things I've had to do, one of the absolute most unpopular things I've ever done. I, I got a pretty hurtful email from one of the pastors from church, like, essentially telling me that if I make this choice, that he guarantees that my life will spiral out of control. I'm a self-proclaimed minimalist now. I, f I saw some just abstract art that I liked and it was like 90 bucks online. So I was like, I could just buy the materials myself and figure this out. And so I went to Michael's, they're having a great sale. I've never been a sales shopper, it felt great. And uh, actually I went to Hobby Lobby and then Michael's, which, even, which I don't even know who I am anymore. But um, just spent a couple hours just in the kitchen with a trash bag, just painting away. And it, I found it to be very therapeutic. It was relaxing for me. Um, as you can tell, I'm not very good, but I don't even care, I still, it still made it on my wall. This is the one I copied. I was going to buy it. 85 bucks. Yeah, I like blue since I was a kid. Um, so it really has nothing to do with this being like a back the blue type print. To be clear, I do back the blue, obviously, but it's just, it's totally separate from that. Well, I got some homework to do. You working on fractions? Yeah. When you're ready to try some college algebra, let me know. You yeah, can... I'll wait till college. Oh, uh, OK. You should do it? Yeah. Mm. 6 minus 5 is 1 over 6. Perfect. I don't think you need any more of my help. I think you know how to do this. Yep. All right, go finish up the rest of them, OK? I'll be graduating at the end of this year. And uh, my only regret is I didn't do it sooner. <laughs> First Thessalonians. And so those kinds of things are there. Good. Let me start over here. I was in school over 15 years ago working on my degree. In fact, I was almost done. I was new on the police department, married, new baby. Just didn't feel like I had the time to fit it in. I've always been status quo seems to be good enough. 
But what prompted me to go back really was Joe. Uh, when he came to me as a partner, he was out of the Marine Corps. He, you know, his life was all over the place. And um, my life was, uh, you know, I, I say boring is good. You know, I had a very boring life and I still do. I, I love the fact that I come home from work. I've got my family. I've got a routine where, uh, you know, I, I, I spend time with my family. I help my daughter with homework. We have dinner, I do a workout, I practice martial arts, and then I read the Bible and I go to bed. And that is my life every day. And, you know, when Joe and I became partners, he was going through a difficult time with his family and he wanted to do something productive. So he decided to get his master's degree. And the whole time I'm, I'm saying to myself, if he can do this, going through everything he's going through, what is stopping me? In San Antonio, two police officers are in critical condition after a shootout. San Antonio's police chief said he has no idea why the men opened fire on his officers. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we ask that you watch over the families of Julio Cavazos and Miguel Moreno. It's been a very difficult last 18 hours or so, and, and Lord, we just ask that you uh, be present for them. Times like this are very difficult for us. We ask that you watch us today, guide our attitudes, watch our mouths, our, our minds, our thoughts, protect us, Lord, watch over us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Chief's about to speak. Oh, Chief. Uh, so, uh, let me start with two officers who were assigned from Central Patrol B-Shift for vehicle burglaries. And they happened to cross a vehicle that looked like it had been broken into. Someone entered out of the car, and the one suspect walked toward the police car. The other suspect immediately opened fire. Officer Moreno went down immediately. Officer Cavazos came around the vehicle. Uh, he also was shot. Officer Cavazos will survive, according to doctor's reports. Uh, Officer Moreno uh, is not expected to survive. I know the docs have their peer support and everything like that, but I would like to see one or two yard roll calls, maybe three of y'all, and find a private area. And if somebody wants to talk, one of y'all take them back there and talk with them and, and, and you know, just do what y'all do. You know? It just might be like they, they'll see our face initially and they'll be like, no, nah, I don't want to talk to them. And then maybe they'll just let it simmer in their, in their head for a little bit and say, you know what, maybe I should talk to them. We both work Central at one point, and I work B-Shift with those guys. Can't imagine how you're feeling right now, man, so if you need anything. Let's just see what we saw yesterday, man. It was, it's, it's gonna be some guys gonna need to talk about it, so. So pretty much everybody's available if they want more people this weekend or something? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me turn the lights on outside. I'm gonna start getting dressed in a second, okay? All right. Your eggs are in here also, your egg whites, okay? So this will be your breakfast. When I'm working overtime, putting on a uniform, there's a difference that takes place. When I'm at work in mental health, people don't know I'm a police officer. But you're tired. Uh -huh. But you're tired of the day, I'm tired. Yeah, today was, today was, today was a long day. Yeah. It's going to be miserable in this kind of heat right now. Mm -hmm. Were y'all working tonight? The east side, where they've had all the shootings lately. Okay. We're going to meet, and it's my turn to drive. It's a lot tighter. Love you. All right, love you. Group hug. All right. I'll see you in the morning. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good night. You gonna park right there? Oh wow. <laughs> did you bring your lunch? Yes. What did you bring? 
Ample snacks. <laughs> what does ample snacks consist of? Uh, some Pringles. I have a Red Bull. Okay. Twizzlers for when I need a health kick. <laughs> wow, you brought your vitamin sticks, huh? <laughs> huh. Um, Where's the sandwich in all this? That didn't get made. <clears throat> Well, if we don't get stuck on a late call, I actually have an extra breakfast of egg whites, oatmeal, and turkey bacon. If you get hungry, I want a decent meal.
we'll allow you to be a part of every part of this process, okay? You've already taken the first step, okay? That's a big step, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much for trusting us. Kedra, you're, you're obviously in a lot of pain right now, okay? Let us help you out. You don't understand. It doesn't work anymore. Kendra, Kendra that, 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 that's not a good option for you. Kendra, we... No, no. Hey, focus on us, okay? Sit down, sweetheart. Let's talk for a minute, okay? If you had a list of priorities for help, what would be your number one help? Would it be... Well, that's not an option. You know, that's not going to help anything, okay? You say you're lying to me. Okay, I promise you, we have not told you one lie. Let me let me show you that you can trust us. You know what? You're stronger than the voices, Kendra. You know, yes, you are. Let's just let's just focus on each other right now, okay? It's just us three. Okay, we don't need to worry about anybody else. We just need to worry about us three here. All right? And I just want you to shake my hand so I can, you can show me that I, no, you can trust me. Grab me. I'm an old man. I can't jump up and grab you, okay? If I shake your hand and walk away, will you trust me? I, won't, I'm, I promise you I'm not going to grab you. Shake my hand. I'm going to let you go. You're one of my best friends. He's not going to let you. I'm not going to grab you. I promise you. That's it. It's good to meet you, okay? That's it. Thank you. There you go. Thank Kendra. you. You can trust us, Kendra. I know you are. I know you are. Here, sit, sit down and let's talk and let's get some information, okay? You're doing good. Okay. Relax. Relax. There you go. All right. Okay. Where? Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Let's talk about some options. Have you been to Laurel Ridge? I don't want to go there. Okay. Have you been to San Antonio Behavioral Health? It's a new facility. No. Okay. So you've never been there. So you haven't tried everything there. It seems like you're out of options, but you're not. You're not out of options. You're okay. Let, let's get something to eat, something to drink, and then we'll figure out what's a good what's a good option for you, okay? I'm going to stand up, okay? There you go. You're okay, sweetheart. There you go. There you go. You hungry? We've told you that we're keeping our word, all right? You just need an anti-anxiety to calm yourself down a little bit. Okay. When's the last time you had one? Okay. So you can probably use one right there. Okay. All right. Looks like you've calmed down a little bit, okay? And that's good. All right. So let's talk about some options of getting you some help. Do you have any kind of funding source at all, like Medicare, Medicaid, anything? No? Okay. Okay. That's all right. Have you ever been to the crisis center? That's, no. Oh, wow. Okay. What, what we can do is that when they get ready to give you a treatment plan for discharge, we can have them call us. we got to figure out a way we're going to be able to find you and get a hold of you. I need to check in and make sure you're going to be all right. We're going we're gonna to take you to talk to a counselor. That's not true. You met two people tonight that do care. Just worry, just focus on your breathing, okay? I just called and spoke to the uh, the nurse and the doctor. They're there waiting on you right now. This is 5799, adult female to the crisis center, 601 North Street. Are you getting some air back there? There should be some vents right above you. Okay. Well, when they get ready to discharge you, I'm going to give you my phone number, and you call me. All right? If you need a ride there or whatever you need, you, you call me or Joe. We're going to help you. 3320 Indy Mileage is 35809. When you all graduate? September 1st. September 1st, okay. So understand that the chief has made mental health unit priority on this department, and it'll only work if you use it. All right, this is really the future of policing, and I'll be honest, as a police cadet, not that this surprise anybody in here, but my focus wasn't how to talk to people the right way. I mean, teach me how to drive fast and teach me how to shoot my gun and teach me how to breach a door. And I understand that I am not popular for standing up here in front of you guys and telling you this, but I also understand that the high 90s percent of every call you make is gonna be some form of an emotional disturbance where someone just needs you to show up and give a shit. Okay guys, let me get your attention for a second. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Michelle Mata and Verna Lister. These ladies have dedicate their time to 
share their stories with you guys. They're here representing NAMI, National Alliance for Mental Illness. Don't be afraid to ask us anything. Please forgive me, I'm a little nervous. Uh, you know, a room full of police officers. <laughs> Usually I'm being arrested or something. <laughs> Mental health humor. Yes, sir. When, when people hear voices, are they um, thoughts or are they like somebody's talk, talking to you? Uh, for myself, when I hear voices, I, I hear voices and I sometimes wonder, you know, I hear them, why can't you? Uh, but those voices are real. I had one daughter, she could hear the neighbors 10 houses down and couldn't believe that I couldn't hear them. Um, hallucinations, seeing things. She thought she saw a man in the street that just shot six people and called for help. These are biological brain disorders. For you to say, no, you're not seeing them, you're not gonna get anywhere because they are seeing them. What can we do to reassure you as a parent? We're there to deal with the crisis, but what can we do to help you as well? Education. That's what helped me. Yes, sir. I don't want to use the wrong term, but like when you were having episodes uh, versus now, do you remember like your thought processes and everything? To tell you the truth, when I'm in a crisis, I don't know what's going on. Remember that there's, there's somebody inside of that person that's having a crisis. Talking to them and calming is what they need. And I'm not saying, I'm saying you protect yourselves. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying these people normally are not violent. Thank you so much for, for listening to us today and taking the train. Looks like Amanda's already here, probably already inside. Hello. Hey. <laughs> uh, sweetheart. Yeah, you. you look great. Hi. What is up? What is up? Well, I'm a month and a half clean, and I feel, wow. I feel clean. I was just telling my friend on the phone, I said, a month ago, I was about to jump off the bridge. Look at me now. Like, I think. You kind of motivated me to, because you're like, you're scared of heights. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm scared of life, but I, that doesn't mean give up. So I was shocked. I didn't know that the police knew about mental health. Um, it, it's hard because, you know, you want to, I want to do so much, but I have to go. You have to be so patient. I have to be patient, yeah. So you got you to set short-term goals that are achievable. Yeah. And then even if it's just that day and you know where help is. Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm gonna get a job. That's my first short-term goal, and I got that, so I'm like. And it feels good, right? What are they gonna have you do, you know? I'm a server. Okay, what are your hours gonna be? Probably like four to 10, and then maybe sometimes overnight. So on that overnight shift, that bar breakout crowd mm -hmm. and the rowdy groups that are the party yeah, lifestyle, and, and it is gonna appeal or appear attractive at points, especially mm -hmm. if you're having a bad day, and then all, here's the problem is you're on a slippery slope, right? Between doing really well and succeeding and completely falling apart and undoing everything you've done, mm -hmm. which is what happened that night, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. The other side of that is look what, look how it's been now, right? So, so I'm concerned about you working the overnight shift, but I think as long as, again, you're talking about it, you're thinking about it, um, then you'll be better equipped to deal mm -hmm. with that. But uh, I'm, I'm confident that you're gonna do well. Thank you and shut all these weirdos out at 3 a.m. <laughs> Say, hey, Kendra, you wanna go party after? I like you, you got a pretty smile. You'd be like, hell no. Uh, well, I gotta go home to my dog, Joe. <laughs> right? Cause that's what you're gonna name him. Little that's Joey. That's what we're gonna name him, Little there Joey. Go, little Joey. Just say no comment. <laughs> Great to see you, Kendra. Thanks for coming by. You're welcome. How are you? All right, Miss Kendra. Bye. You know how to reach us. Yes. Do it before you need it, okay? I will. But if you need it, you can call us too then, okay? Yeah. See ya. That was good, man. Wow. Well, I made my day. Two forty-one. An abandoned vehicle 
They said inside the vehicle they found a gun and ammo. Caller states they found Mel who was trying to commit suicide. He's at the front door of Sugars. Let's see what's happening here. So he just bought that? Yeah, we just beat him to it. Did he have it loaded up yet or no? No. Okay. Is he cooperating pretty good? Yeah, he's cooperating. Okay. I mean, he just told us what his plan was. Yeah. Apparently he came here because he says he's trying to feel a certain way before he was going to take his own life. Yeah. Hey, what's going on, man? What up again? Be begin with today. What happened today? I woke up and, you know, I didn't like the reality of that man. So you just went today to buy that gun, bro? I did, yeah. Have you ever tried to kill yourself in the past? The thoughts, I was scared of myself. That that feeling in your stomach, you know, that okay. anxiety and that, that fear and that, because all I ever wanted in life was just the family. Just work hard, provide for them. Where's your dad at? Dad's right there. Oh, that's your pop? Oh, my boss. Your boss? How'd your boss get out here? Did you call him? If you shift the perspective, it's embarrassing or that's a community of people that give a shit. Yeah, they all care about me. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> of course you do, man. All I do is fuck up. Cause heartache. But that's the beauty of family though. You're allowed to. But I want the person that doesn't give a shit about me that would walk and run all over me. It's maybe because I feel for her, like, how fucked up she is, you know what I'm saying? I could give you an hour-long class on that, brother. I've got five kids from three women, so I can relate, but I don't know what your dynamics are, your family situation, the mess that's behind all this, I don't know, but I would venture to say that your childhood relationships yeah. weren't perfect. Oh, yeah, I mean, fucking ex-husband was, he beat the shit out of me and my mom all Right. Time. Well, I can only tell you because it's similar, and that's what I grew up with, and I have the same issues. Yeah, well, you have your problems, man. Yeah, it sucks. Because I've struggled with suicidal thoughts, you know, and it's like, I see it almost weekly out here in the job I do, where we're too late, or people do it, and it's like, fuck. I, I really think that help would benefit you. And I know it might not feel like it right now, but... You've got a lot to be hopeful for, even if it doesn't seem like it right now. Trust me. 7821. Does he have any medical needs at this time? He is ambulatory, he is not intoxicated, he is not compromised, and he is not violent. And were there any weapons seized? There is a firearm, however, we are going to release it to a family member. 835, perfect. I'll call ahead and let them know you're going to be in Russia. Okay, thank you. The uh, firearm is being released to the death. I explained to him the process but yeah. he was good about wanting to keep it and putting it in a safe. Okay. All right. Next time we gotta take it though. Okay. Can I talk to you real quick? As far as the firearm goes. He already gave it to me. I know. Oh. I'm, just, I'm just letting you know oh. because if you give him access oh. and then something happens, We've had guns around the house all the time. I know. Guns, you know. Yeah, just don't give them access. No. All right. We'll get them squared away tonight. Okay. All right. Appreciate Thank it. you, sir. Hi. How are you? Good. Made a suicidal outcry. Going through some situational depression. You are in emergency detention. You will be here in 48 hours. He's not liking the news. You want to talk to him? It's temporary. Remember we talked about that. This is all temporary. This isn't forever. You're not in trouble. It's just we we need to get you squared away, man. You can keep the shoes, but not the laces. That's what it oh, is. Yeah. The laces are a hazard, so they need to leave. Even if it's frustrating, cooperate with what they tell you to do, man. You'll get out of here, and, and I'm going to follow up with you in a couple of days. All right. He's getting scared. Damn. Damn. Hey, though. When you have that connection, 
it's it's so hard for me to let certain things go. I know that I can't fix it, right? I can't. I I can hospitalize them. That's going to keep them safe for a 24, 48, 72 hour period of time, but it doesn't change their life. And so it's hard sometimes to realize that you're only maybe the first step, which is good. Um, but I wish it could be more. How was class? It was good. It was good. We had a guy last night that went and bought a gun and bullets and was going to kill himself. And I told him that I really wanted to follow up with him. Is he in the hospital right now? He so... might be released because he's unfunded. Is there a way to find out if he's still at Nick's? Yeah, yeah I mean, you could just call over Nick's. I'll be incredibly impressed if he's still at the Knicks. He was brought in last night around 10 p.m. He's already discharged? Wow. OK, thank you so much. It's not even a 24-hour stay. I'm going to call him because I felt like we had a thing going. Hey, bud, it's uh, Joe Smarrow, the officer that met you last night and spoke with you for a little while before you went to the Knicks. Um, Called up there to follow up. They said you've already been discharged. So we called the mental health authority that got some information for you. So if you could please call back, uh, I'd appreciate it. And I'll give you a shout tomorrow or next week just to keep nagging you, man, until you take my call. All right? Quit screening me. I'll talk to you soon, bud. All right, bye-bye. Men are 60 times more likely to reattempt suicide post discharge, um, and women are 102 times more likely to reattempt post discharge. One of the sticking points for me and, and the work that we do on this unit and the call we had last night is exposure. We see it on the screen suicide in progress, suicide completion, dead on arrival. We see it, you know, weekly. When you see it time and time again, it becomes normalized and it's not normal. I've seen it in the Marine Corps, a, a brother Marine killed himself in Iraq. And then I've seen it on the police department with an officer who hung himself at headquarters. We had been helping him for a year and got him into counseling. He was doing extensive counseling several times a week. He, you know, it was just, and then to, and to, experience his level of anxiety day in and day out and the stress he was going through and just the, the amount of problems that he was undertaking on, on his own and and then to see him hanging in the police garage just completely still it's eerie you know but, but you know unless his struggles over there's like this exhale of they're at peace police department culture, right? We're kind of a little subculture within society. We, we're, we're just different, right? We, uh, we, we have to process and deal with a lot of uh, traumatic stuff. We're gonna talk a little bit about the three suicides that we've had here in the last 16 months at work. It's a reality of what is suicide in law enforcement that we kill ourselves three to one versus dying in the line of duty, all right? So there's a trend happening. We need to have a lot of insight to ourselves, and we need to be extremely honest with ourselves too when it comes to what our needs are. I'm not gonna ask you what your coping skills are. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand and everyone go around the room and tell me, how do you deal with a bad day? How do you deal with it when your wife gets mad at you? What's your coping skill? I like to drink 30 beers. You know, I like to go out and shoot my gun like off into the air. Whatever it is that we do, not all of us have like a, a lock box at home with a, a box of beautiful pens, and we get home after a bad day and we open up and we just start journaling. Today was the worst day. You guys don't do that, right? I guarantee you guys don't do that. But what I am asking, guys, is that you not stare me in the face and say, you know, Joe, I've always wanted to know what it would feel like to shoot myself in the head. I've always wondered. And for my entire career now, 
I've taken my weapon and I, I would empty it, you know, I'd visibly and physically inspect it to make it clear, and I put it to my head and I pull the trigger. Is that a healthy behavior? Is that a good coping skill? So when we're coming to you and we're talking to you about police officer suicides, I'm asking, I'm asking, I'm pleading with you to step up and um, really look after one another. You know, music works for some people, paint works for some people, writing. Um, and so for me, it's just, it's something that helps control the thoughts. I'm someone uh, with an unfortunate upbringing or not ideal childhood. I have no memories of anything prior to like third grade um and when i hear kids talk about kindergarten or first grade i'm like wow how, like how do they remember that stuff you know and i think my brain kind of blacked out certain things um my father was deployed he was in the navy and my my mother had an affair and the guy she was having an affair with he he uh sexually molested my sister and i and as a kid, you can't process something like that. Just the amount of disconnect from like a loving family. I never saw a good marriage. I never saw a good representation of a relationship. I never had any idea what love was, what you know, commitment was. I, I didn't know. And so by the time I was a senior in high school, I, you know, have unprotected sex and then you have a kid. I was an 18-year-old father who just graduated high school four days ago and was like, let's go to the Marine Corps. And it wasn't till I got out and was out for eight years and then I'm at VA getting therapy and I never realized why of all the things that I experienced in Iraq, the kids bothered me the most. And then I get into the police department and it's like the kids that bother me the most. It was brought to my attention that like, the reason that's the problem for you is because you're that kid. I love feelings. It's, <laughs> I say that jokingly, but also honestly, that's every time I'm in therapy and I'm talking about anything, my therapist hands me this piece of paper, which I just want to punch a hole in. And it's the feeling wheel. And it's just a wheel of emotions and I'll get like amped up when I'm venting about something or I'll get excited about something. And she'll just hand it to me very like calmly, like, what are you feeling? I'm like, oh, I just wanna rip this thing. But there's value in it because I get to use a lot of what I've experienced and learned and help other people. But it's just, you've, it's a fine line between giving of yourself and allowing yourself to be got. I haven't heard from Joe yet this morning, but he'll, he'll text me. Hey. Hey. Um, I'm on 281, headed to go see, uh, check on Kendra right now. See if we can't Checking find on Kendra? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, 
All right, Bessie. All right. Love you, sweetheart. Love you. Bye-bye. Okay, love you. I'm not sure what room number, so we'll have to find out. This is the last known address I know of. Hello? I spoke to the management here. They said that uh, they had to ask her and her boyfriend to leave about two weeks ago uh, because he was continually beating her. And um, so they had to ask him to leave because it was just causing too many problems, all the fighting that was going on here. So she felt sorry for Kendra because she shouldn't be getting beat like that. So now we try to find out where she went. I can't see. What does that one say? Does that say two? I think so. Hey, oh, hey, get in here. Hi. Just look at you. Look at you. Hi, goodness, I'm good. How you doing? Great. Come in. I've been running around trying to find I you. I know, I hear. Yeah. We had got our own hotel room, tried to make it work. It didn't. Management told me that they had to, to ask y'all to leave because the violence was starting to get out of hand, that he was hitting you and beating mm -hmm. you. And yeah. uh, so I, I, I couldn't even imagine what, what yeah. was going, going on with you. I don't know, you, you know, as, I guess with me, with that was, I just wanted to feel loved, you know, and at times he did feel, make me feel that way, you know, and that's why I stayed. But. You no, know, I packed up. Needs to bring me over here. Um, this person's great. Uh, I mean, I've been knowing him for five years, and I wake up, I'm happy. I'm stress-free. I have no worries. I'm drug-free. Some days I could just be overjoyed, and I can't give you an answer why I'm so happy, but... Okay. All right. You know you have support. All right. You know that we're here for you. Mm. We don't want Kendra on the bridge no more. All right? <laughs> no. That was a rough night. Yeah. Uh, I think you've come a long way since then. You've had some setbacks, okay, and that's life. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, but, you know, how you deal with it and how you grow from that is, is you know, I'm going to set you up for the next time there's a crisis because they're going to come. They're yeah. inevitable, right? Mm -hmm. Don't don't hesitate to call us, you know. I shouldn't be the one always trying to chase you. True. Okay? Yeah. I, we do it because we care. Yeah. But um, understand that it, we're just a phone call away, you know, and, and we, you know, we've always stopped what we're doing to to come and help you. Yeah. Is there anything that you need right now from us? Um, Be honest. No. I've been. Did you get food stamps? I have my Did you get stamps. Medicaid? I have my women's health. You get women's health? Yeah. Okay, so you got all that. Where are you at with your disability? I'm not sure. Um, I'll reach out to the benefits officer that you worked mm -hmm. with. Just gotta get back in touch with her, like you said. <laughs> Schedule an appointment by the end of the week. Joe. Joe, words of wisdom, Joe? I just hope that you follow through with everything that's available to you because there's, there's a lot of good programs that are out there and just because you're in a good relationship and just because you have family and friends and support mm -hmm and a place to go that's safe and you're not being hit and you're not using drugs doesn't mean that you don't still have issues yeah. that need to be worked through, right? And so uh, it's important that even though you're in a good relationship, if that's yeah. true, I hope so, yeah. and even if you are drug free, if that's true and I hope so, then you still need to make sure you're doing your maintenance. Yeah. You deserve to be happy, but truly. Yeah. You need to focus on you. Um, you need to follow through with what Amanda's saying. You need, I mean, but I don't want to tell you all the things you have to do. If you want us on board, we're happy to join you. If you want to throw us overboard, that's, that's an option too. All right. Yeah. That's what we want. <laughs> all right. You got it. Take care. All right. 
It's good right, to see so. you. Thanks for coming. She seemed good. She seems good. I don't buy it. No? Like you said, she's got support. She wants it. She just hadn't utilized it very much in the past. I don't think she wants it. She wants a boyfriend that's going to take care that's of her. That's going to love her. And, and that's that. I think that was the most honest thing is she wants to be loved, which we all do. But I think that is priority. You know? I, I don't know. And again, she hasn't reached out. She tracked her down through her sister. She, it's just, I think it's obvious, but what do I know? I only have a little bit of a lot of experience. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting us out and having us out here. We're going to talk to you a little bit about mental health, okay? Is mental health an issue in the schools? Yes. Really? A little bit or a lot? A lot. A lot. Um, has anybody had that happen in their classroom, a full-blown crisis? Yes. We had a little girl who was hiding up under the sink because hands were coming out of the floor and the mirror to get her. This child was actually having hallucinations. Do you mind if we do a little demonstration? Are you all okay with that? Yeah. You're a big guy. Come on up here, big guy. <laughs> all right. I need you four right here. All right, this is what we're going to do. You ready? So when somebody is having auditory hallucinations, all you are is another voice. Okay, nice and loud. Y'all ready? Have you seen the one? What did you do today? So, so dumb. I can't believe you said that. Just, just, jump off. Oh, oh, sir, I need you to focus on my voice. Can you focus on my voice? Okay, I'm here to help you. You understand? I'm here to help you. You're not in any trouble. What should I do? Okay. All right, good. What did I say? Focus on me. Listen to my voice. You made it more intimate, if you wish. Okay. And you could understand me? Yeah. Okay, good. We're good? Yes. Sarge called Ernie and I in and explained that we're updating policy specific to weapons that we take off of the consumers that we're placing in the hospitals. Essentially what happens is anytime we encounter someone that is threatening suicide or homicide, or even if they're mentally decompensated and they have access to a firearm, we now take the firearm, put it in the property room. Then I work hand in hand with the county clerk to find out, is this person gonna be committed or not? If they get committed, they essentially lose access to that firearm. If they are not being committed, or trying to get the firearm released to a family member, that person has to sign an affidavit saying, I will not give access of this firearm to the person that we took into custody. And so within the department, there's there's been a huge shift Been on the department 12 years, been on this unit. Last month was nine years. When I came on, we didn't have mental health on the computer screens, it wasn't a call. We have completely normalized the terms, but I know that I'm not in the majority of thinking that way in this profession, but I'm hoping that is going to change whether that's with my help and voice or it's a national movement or whatever it is, at least we're starting the conversation. Yeah, this is going to be a big one. It is. I can already tell this is going to be bigger than last year's. Yep. I can tell that for sure. It sure is. All right. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good That's my son, Reed. <clears throat> this walk attracts all the people from the community. It brings in police department, uh, sheriff's department, the hospitals, two different academy classes. Hey. Cool, dude. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Sarge. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. I've been a policeman here for 22 years. I was here when mental health didn't work. I was here when police officers weren't doing the right things. Hey, Gilbert, are you going to be at the school next month? Yeah. Okay. I'm towards the end of my career. 
hopefully, Lord willing, I'm going to maybe work another five years, and uh, hopefully that's it. But until that time, I want to be a part of this. Hey, how are you? Hi. He actually came to the house. She was just in crisis. Yes. Well, we appreciate all that you're doing. Oh, you got it. There go the cadets. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When the worlds of the police and the mentally ill collide on the street, it's usually a bad outcome. We can pretty much assure ourselves that it's not going to work out like that because of our CIT training. 40 hours, every person on the department, every cadet before they graduate from the academy. The day has come. It's been about six weeks of preparation. I was honored enough to be selected by TEDx to speak at the event this year. and. You know, because I am very comfortable public speaking and, and teaching, I really thought that this was gonna be pretty easy. And I can tell you stepping into the theater for the first time yesterday and going on stage and being on the red dot that I've been watching on, you know, the internet and YouTube and everything for years was very surreal to actually be there and to see the sign behind you. And, and I made it through the first two sentences and completely locked up my brain went black and I had no clue what I was talking about. Like, what is happening? <laughs> I was like, I have no idea, except I am not ready. How many people are in here? 500. I mean, what year would you prefer it all? Right. Right? I don't know what's going on with this. I don't think it's supposed to float like that. You ready, Joe? I realized I was showing too much cleavage. I was going to say, you don't want to show your... Okay, so what are you going to do with your notes? Two of these is where I was getting stuck. Okay, just hold it in your hand, and if you need it, reference it. <sighs> Deep breath. I'm a police officer, possibly quite different than most. Years ago, there was a blockbuster movie, Avatar, and they had this simple three-word greeting they would use when they saw each other, and it really resonated with me. I see you. I see you. So I work on a specialized unit in law enforcement, and all the calls we respond to are people suffering from a a mental health crisis. But everything about how I respond to these calls goes against what most would expect. In fact, the only weapon I've relied on over the last nine years has been my ability to listen and empathize with people, to connect. I tell them how sorry I am that I showed up uninvited. I tell them how sorry I am that they have to live with their difficult diagnosis. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, we live in a country where 20 to 25% of our adult population has a diagnosable mental illness. 4% of those have a serious mental illness, and less than half of these individuals will engage in treatment at any point throughout the year. So how do we improve? How do we make things better? Let's be honest. I lied earlier when I said I am a police officer. Law enforcement is what I do. 
but I am Joe, and you are, insert your name. I'm a father, I'm a United States Marine Corps combat veteran, I'm a survivor of childhood physical abuse, I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, and I have a mental illness. And throughout my career, I've learned to look at another person and say, though perhaps not explicitly with my words, but I see you. That is, you don't have to hide from me. You don't have to pretend with me. And you certainly don't have to fear me because I can relate to you. I see you. Some of the things I've shared with you may have made some of you uncomfortable. Honestly, good. I choose to speak openly about my experiences in hopes that it will inspire someone, if even one, to take necessary risks for their own mental health. Now, I'm fortunate to work on a progressive police department that gets it and provides the type of support that I'm talking about here today. But I don't want this idea of empathy and connection and seeing each other to get stuck in this small circle of first responders or law enforcement. What if we took the great words of Arthur Ashe when he said, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Maybe then we could all connect and move forward in the right direction. And finally, let's agree to stop being so afraid. Let's stop hiding. I see you. Thank you. I know that some new numbers uh, were just released, but there was an increase in mental health calls. Yeah, we're, we're going to see an increase in calls. Uh, that's just been the trend. I go to a lot of cities and I do, and I speak to a lot of departments. And the first thing I ask them is, do you collaborate with your local mental health authority? And so many times I get, oh, forget it, they're impossible. And I said, then, then you're spinning your wheels because if you don't collaborate, you're not gonna have a successful program. Tonight, we're on the streets with one police department's mission to change their approach to interactions with the mentally ill. that out of your system. Are you done? Are you ready to go to work? I'm amped up, man. I'm so ready to help people. 